The next flight Starship is ready to fly. We are waiting for regulatory approval. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It, 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 it really should not be possible to build a giant rocket faster than the r paper can move from one desk to another. Okay, the truth is exactly as Elon says, but unfortunately his beloved starship is currently stuck under the grip of the government's FAA Environmental Agency. To join forces in seeking fairness for starship everyone, including Congress, NASA is now pressuring the FAA to allow starships launch. So what's the reason behind that? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech, and thank you for watching. A September 10th hearing by the House Science Committee Space Subcommittee on Encouraging Commercial Space Innovations While Maintaining Public Safety became a forum for complaints about a set of commercial launches and re-entry regulations at the FAA, known as FAA's Part 450. FAA's Part 450 regulations were introduced back in 2021, consolidating previous regulations, Parts 415, 417, 431, and 435, into a single framework with the aim of simplifying the licensing process. Hmm. It seemed that the licensing process would be streamlined, but in reality, it's gotten even more complicated. Many people in the launch industry have warned since the regulations took effect in 2021 the companies are finding it very difficult to get licenses under Part 450. Industry officials raised concerns about 450 during an October 2023 hearing of the Senate Commerce Committee's Space Subcommittee, with one witness, SpaceX's Bill Gerstenmaier, warning that the entire regulatory system is at the risk of collapse due to the difficulties in getting licenses under these new regs. So far, witnesses at the House hearing made it clear that those concerns have not gone away. The way it is being implemented today has caused severe licensing delays, confusion, and is jeopardizing our long-held leadership position, said Dave Kovasa, president of Commercial Space Flight Federation, an industry group whose members include several launch companies. The FAA aims to clarify its regulations through a set of documents called advisory circulars. These circulars are designed to provide guidance on how licensed applicants can demonstrate compliance with the agency's rules. However, as Kovosa pointed out, the FAA has not yet even released many of these planned circulars leaving some uncertainty in that compliance process. Mike French, serving as the vice chair of the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Group, Comstack for the FAA, echoed these worries. He highlighted that Comstack has put forward several suggestions to the FAA to tackle issues with Part 450. Among these proposals were two key ideas. First, extending the FAA's 180-day valuation period for completed license applications to encompass certain aspects of the pre-application phase, and second, permitting companies to fall back on existing legacy regulations in situations where advisory circulars for the new rules have not yet been issued. These recommendations aim to streamline the process and provide more flexibility for companies navigating the regulatory landscape. And the criticism of this new framework for its lack of transparency and significant delays is indispensable. We have a licensing regime with a lack of certainty, a lack of transparency, and significant delays, said Pamela Meredith, chair of the Space Law Practice Group at KMA Zuckert, LLC. Members of Congress agreed with what space industry reps mentioned. Representative Brian Babin of Texas, the chair of the subcommittee, he said that the licenses are being processed at a snail's pace, while Representative Haley Stevens, a Democrat out of Michigan, said the process is no different than bureaucratic soup. In addition, Babin has expressed deep concern about potential repercussions for NASA's Artemis. He pointed out that the human landing system landers, currently under development by SpaceX and Blue Origin, are set to launch using commercial licenses. Drawing a stark comparison, he warned, at this pace we might see Chinese Taikonauts setting foot on the moon while American industries remain grounded by excessive bureaucracy. This statement underscores his worry that regulatory hurdles could significantly impede U.S. progress in the space race, potentially allowing other countries to take the lead. Indeed, China is currently progressing very efficiently in their race to the moon. They've openly challenged NASA's Artemis program by carrying out several lunar landings and returning samples. Their goal is to put humans on the moon by 2029 and establish a moon base by 2030 with expansion plans extending to 2050. According to publicly available info from SpaceX, the FAA is now going to delay Starship's Flight 5 until at least November. The company added that the flight's been ready to launch since August, and the FAA had previously indicated that everything would be ready by mid-September. While the U.S. has long been the world leader in space launches, Babin stated that the country cannot ever take this for granted and noted that there's a risk that companies will conduct space launches abroad where more light-touch approvals are available. In response to these accusations, the FAA did not announce any changes to the launch date of Flight 5. What they did was defend themselves.
Defending the licensing regulations in the House was Kelvin Coleman, the FAA's associate admin for commercial space transportation. Coleman noted several measures that the FAA has taken to improve the process, including designing advisory circulars, increasing staff training, and establishing a committee to streamline license approvals. However, Coleman acknowledged that the agency is lagging in the transition from old licenses to new ones. Only six out of about 30 current licenses have made the switch so far. All 30 licenses need to transport to 450 by March. March 2026, which Coleman admitted looks very challenging. He added that companies making amendments during the licensing process are a major factor contributing to the slow pace. Daniel Murray, executive director of the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, which handles license application, offered a similar explanation. Murray said the recent delay in Starship launch is mainly due to the ongoing environmental impact review, but added that SpaceX has also changed the scope of its flight plan. They chose to do something different, Murray said. They pivoted, and we pivoted with them. What do you think of that statement? Personally, I think it's ridiculous. An interesting thing that the space community discovered regarding the FAA's reason for delaying SpaceX, the hot staging ring got added to IFT2 and the environmental impact of dropping into the Gulf of Mexico is covered by the FAA's written revaluation for IFT2. But FAA did not need to consult with national fisheries when getting to this conclusion. They just gave a reasonable explanation. To quote from the FAA's November 2023 written reevaluation. The 2022 PEA assumed that in the event the vehicles were expended downrange at sea, most of the launch vehicles would sink because they're made of steel. Lighter items may float, but would be expected to eventually become waterlogged and sink. In accordance with the PEA, if there are reports of large debris during future expended missions, SpaceX would coordinate with a party specialized in marine debris to survey the situation and sink or recover as necessary any large floating debris. SpaceX would continue to comply with its mitigation responsibilities as outlined in the NMFS LOC for launch and reentry vehicle operations in the marine environment. Note the 2022 PEA's consultation with NMFS listed the entire Gulf of Mexico as an action area, which means they consider the impact of dropping super heavy into any location in the Gulf of Mexico. So how is it that adding a hot staging ring and dropping it into the Gulf of Mexico didn't require consultation, yet changing its drop location now requires consultation, causing a 60-day delay? Is the FAA doing their job properly, or has political motivation started to creep in? Let us know what you think down there in the comments. However, in reality, FAA has been working diligently with SpaceX, but perhaps it's not just a matter of their incompetence. It's that they're operating within a pretty inefficient system. The FAA has employed over 45,000 people and has struggled in recent years to keep up with the growing number of rocket launches from commercial space companies. In 2023, SpaceX launched 98 rockets, accounting for 87% of the launches that the agency reportedly oversaw last year. Undoubtedly, the agency forecasts that number of launches will triple by 2028. To accommodate this growth, the Biden administration requested $57 million to fund the FAA's licensing office, a big increase from the $38 million the office got last year. The FAA also hired an additional 33 staff members for its licensing office last year. Dan Murray said at Global Aerospace Summit in D.C. on September 11th that his office is dedicating most of its resources to SpaceX. They get the majority of our resources, he said in the report, 80 percent of the overtime that we log, and this is hundreds of hours a month, which goes to SpaceX. Even so, things don't seem to be very effective, and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has grown quite impatient with the FAA by now. Of course, these regulations weren't created solely by the FAA. The entire government apparatus played a role in shaping them. The through line in Musk's hand wringing over the FAA is the billionaire's general disdain for what he views as excessive government regulation. Musk has repeatedly painted rules and bureaucracy as the death knell of innovation. Rules and regulations are immortal. They don't die, Musk said at the Wall Street Journal CEO Summit in 2021. There's not really an effective garbage collective system for removing rules and regulations, and so gradually this hardens the arteries of civilization, and you're able to do less and less over time. Musk has been increasingly vocal on social media about taking a more hands-on role in the White House under a second Trump administration. Much like his approach during his Twitter takeover, Musk has proposed reducing the size of government by stripping down federal agencies. At the All In Summit, Musk did credit the federal employees he might seek to fire. I'm not saying there aren't competent people in the government. They're just in an operating system that's inefficient, he said. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.